All right. So the diagram below, not drawn to scale, which obviously means that we cannot take a rule and measure anything and use that to find the area or the height, right? So that's what that usually implies. Um, shows a cue ball with length 13 centimeters with 4 centimeters in height, 8 centimeters. State in terms of H the area of the shaded face of the cue ball. So the shaded face of the cue ball has dimensions or does width 4 centimeters and height 8 centimeters. So what would be the, 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 um, the expression um, for the area of the shaded face? Oh, um, Sarah put um, area is equal to uh, width times height, and I said it's equal to four centimeters times h, so it's equal to um. All right. Eight. So for one mark, yeah, for one mark, we could just write down a is equal to four h, right? A one mark question usually doesn't require more than one line of response. So either you're going to write down a value or an expression or a formula, right? So yeah, so they would have known that. Um, it's going to be the width by the height, so you could just write down 4H, and of course, you don't even have to put the units because you're not exactly doing a calculation, okay? So that's part two, um, or part one. Part two now says, write an expression in terms of H for the volume of the cuboid. Now, we're talking about a cuboid, and the cuboid, of course, the formula is always going to be vo volume is equal to area of cross-section times the length. So in this particular case, because we already have the expression for the area of the cross-section, we're just going to multiply that by the length to give the volume. So we can see volume is equal to the area times the length, which of course gives us 4H. The length is 13, so this will be equal to 52H. Is that clear? Did you get that? Yes, yes sir. Good. And then part 3 now, part 3 tells us, if the volume of the cube board is 286 centimeters cube, calculate the height h of the cube board. In part two, we just wrote on the expression for the volume, and we can just equate that to 286. So we can say 52h is equal to 286. We want to solve for h, so we divide both sides by 52. Those cancel, so we say h is equal to 286 divided by 52. How many times is that? 104 to 2, 208, um, 260 would be 5. How many times? 5 and a half? 5.5, yes, sir. Right, so, right. so h is equal to 5.5. And, of course, you have to put your unit centimeters, right? So whenever we're doing a calculation in math, which actually requires a unit like length or area or volume, we must put our unit, okay? Because they could be so inclined to start taking off marks if students are consistently leaving off the units. Is that clear? Yes sir. yes, sir. All right, good, good, good. So that one I could say it wasn't that very challenging. All right, let's move to the one above. So similar, well, this question now, the diagram below not drawn to scale represents a plan of a floor. The broken line RS divides the floor into two rectangles, E and B, blah, blah, blah. So this question is worth a total of one, two, um, five, um, eight, 12 marks. So let's try to do this in 12 minutes. And of course, if you finish before the 12 minutes, I will let me know before, because I will, I will say the time has passed. I will stop you after 12, but if you finish before, let me know, because I want to gauge your progress and how you're able to manage these questions, right? So you have to work fast, but efficiently. Um, there's no point in working fast and doing foolishness, okay? So work at your pace, make sure that everything correct is the most important thing. Don't want me to this here, finish in, say, five minutes, I get everything wrong, or I only get two or three marks. It's better to take your time, get the concepts, um, and apply them. And once you start understanding, then you can actually try to step up the pace. Okay? So, all right, go ahead and start this one.
Genie Sir. Okay, good, good, good. Sir, on the last one, sir. Okay, no problem, man. Good, good, good. Okay, sir. Okay, good. All right, so we'll look at this. The diagram below, not drawn to scale, represents a plan of a floor. The broken line RS divides the floor into two rectangles, A and B. All right, so you need to plan there. Um, so part A has, we could say, width length 10 with 5, part B with 3, length 8. And then there's a little part there, 2, and there's a little part there, X. Um, it says calculate the length of RS. So let's we'll see what is happening here. So we know the entire thing is equal to 10, right? So let me use a different color. All right. So if you draw some little lines, lines here, let me see. I'm trying to draw a straight line there. Yes. Right. So this entire thing is equal to 8, and this little piece here is equal to 2. So obviously RS is going to be equal to 6. You got that? Yes, sir. And if RS is equal to 6, yeah, if RS is equal to 6, then it means that 6 plus X is equal to 10, and therefore X is equal to 4. You got that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. So X is equal to 4. Nice. It says calculate the perimeter of the entire floor. By definition, the perimeter of any shape is the total distance around the particular shape. When you're calculating perimeter, you're only going on the outside. So you will not include that dotted line right here, which is the six. You want to include that. You're going on the outside. So you're adding the, the five plus 10 plus this piece here, which of course is five again, then this little piece two, then this little piece three, plus this little piece eight, plus this little piece, which is three, plus this little piece, which of course is four. You're adding up all of that. So in this case, the perimeter is equal to, let me say, 5 plus 10 plus 5 again plus 2 plus 3 plus 8 plus 3 again plus 4. And that, of course, is going to be equal to meters. So 5 plus 10, 15 plus 5, 20, 22, 25, 33, 36, 40. Did you get 40 meters? Yes, sir. So Very that's good. You got who? 52. Uh, let's see. Um, no, that, that, that sounds like you added some things twice or that you should not add any at all. So we have 5. We have the 10. We have this 5 again. We have this 2, this 3, this 8, this 3, this 4. So those are the only things that we're supposed to add. So remember, perimeter is a distance around. So for instance, this 6 even though we're asked to find the value, cannot be included in the perimeter because it's not on the border or on the boundary of the shape. You understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, so just make a little correction, right? Mm -hmm. All right sir. So the perimeter P would be equal to 40 meters. All right, next now we want is to find the area of the entire floor. Now let me just clear up my diagram a little bit here. So the area of the entire floor then, of course, it is rectangular in shape. Well, the, the segments A and B. 
So the total area would be equal to the area of A, which is 10 by 5, plus the area of B, which of course is 3 by 8. So that gives us 50 plus 24, which gives us 74 meters squared. Did you get that? Yes, sir. Good. Yes, sir. And then part G, section A of the floor is to be covered with flooring boards measuring one meter by 20 centimeters. How many flooring boards are needed for covering section A? So what we need to do is to find the area of one covering board, the area of section A, and divide, right? Hopefully it goes into it an exact number of times, but of course we must make sure that we have the proper dimensions. Section A, the dimensions, of course, are given as meter by meter. So this is the area of section A here, which is 50 square meter. For the flooring boards, let's call it the FB. The flooring boards have an area. So the area of the flooring boards would be, now we're given as 1 meter by 20 centimeters. So let's put that into both um, units and meters. So the area of the flooring board is going to be 1 meter by 0 0.20 meters, which of course gives us 0 0.20 meters squared. Right? You following so far? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so that is the area of one flooring board. And so therefore, to find the number of flooring boards that we need, we're going to divide the area of section E by the area of one flooring board. So the area of one flooring board is equal to that. And therefore, the number of flooring boards needed is equal to the area of section A, which is 50 meters squared, divided by the area of one flooring board, which is 0.2 meters squared, and this gives us 250. So this has no unit because it's just a number. So we need 250 of those flooring boards. Is that clear? Yes, sir. All right, good. Yeah, All right, so let's... You have, a, you, have a, you have a question, Jaco? Sir, can I repeat what the... Can I repeat that last one, sir? Oh, yeah, no problem. So this last part here, we're, we're given that... We're given the measurement of a flooring board. We want to determine how many of those flooring boards are needed to cover the area of section A. So it's just like you're building a house and the tile in the house. If you want to know exactly how many tiles you need to buy, you can calculate the area of the, the floor space and the area of one tile. So the area of one tile is, say, one square meter, and the area of the entire floor is 100 square meters. Then you need 100 divided by 1, which is 100 tiles, right? Assuming that you won't have to cut any tile. So in this case, it's a, it's a similar thing. We're going to be covering the area of section A in flooring boards. But what we need to know is how many flooring boards we need to cover the entire area, right? So we, 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 we find the total area of section A and we find the area of one flooring board and we divide them. So the total number of flooring boards needed is equal to the area of section A, which of course is 50 meters squared, divided by the area of one flooring board because we're given that the flooring board measures one meter by 20 centimeters but we cannot be working with meters and centimeters together if we're finding area so we have to express um the centimeter part into meters and of course we did that because we know that 100 centimeters is equal to one meter so therefore, to convert from centimeters to meters, we divide by 100. So say that 20 centimeters will be equal to 20 divided by 100, which is equal to 0 0.20 meters. And that is how we get this 0 0.20 there. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yes. Good. So therefore, the area of one flooring board is the length by the width, 1 meter by 0 0.20 meters. That gives us 0 0.2 square meters. And because the entire area of floor A or section A is 50 meters squared, then we divide that by 0.2, the area of one flooring board, and we get 250 flooring boards. So that's what we need. So if we go to the hardware, we have to buy 250 flooring boards. So when we're talking about a practical situation, you can't be exact because you never know. You might 
damage one fluorine board, so you tend to buy a little extra just in case. You understand? But for this particular case, we need the exact number 250. All right. All right, let's scroll up to this one now. Another um cuboid question. So once again, I'm gonna give you about um a 10 minutes for this one, right? Um, so read the question, figure out exactly what is being asked, and proceed to bring the question, okay? Okay, sir. Yeah, ma'am, please.
finish the hit. Good, good, good. All right, so Fresh Farms Day restores melting cartons in the shape of a cue board with internal dimensions 6 cm by 4 cm by 10 cm, right? So we have a shaded port region there of dimensions of height 10 cm and um, with 4 cm. It says calculate in centimeter cube the volume of milk in each carton. This should not be difficult. We know the formula for the volume of a cue board. Volume is equal to length by width, breadth by height, right? Or by thickness or whichever way we want to refer to those terms. So we'll say that V is equal to length by width by height. So V is equal to, and, and to be honest, it doesn't matter if you put down the dimensions directly below what each of them represent. The most important thing is that you multiply them and multiplication is commutative. So it's going to basically be um, 10 by 4 by 6, which gives us 240 centimeter cube right part two a recipe for making ice cream requires three liters of milk how many cartons of milk should be bought to make the ice cream once again you have to do some conversions we know that 1000 centimeter cube is equal to one liter right so therefore if we want three liters we should get 3000 centimeter cube so 3,000 centimeter cube of milk is equal to 3 liters. But of course, the volume of one carton is equal to 240. So say the number of cartons needed is equal to the volume of milk needed divided by the volume of milk in one carton. Right? So the volume of milk in one carton. And so that gives us 3,000 centimeter cube divided by 240 centimeter cube. So that would be 1.25. Is that 12.5? Yes, sir. So we get 12.5. So 12.5 um, cartons, but can you buy half a carton of milk? No, sir. No. So having calculated this value and gotten 12.5, you notice the question did not ask you how many cartons of milk you need for the recipe. It says how many cartons of milk should be bought. So because you cannot buy half a carton, you can only buy one carton. How many cartons should you buy? 13. 13. 13, that is correct. The next whole number. So therefore, 13 cartons of milk should be buy in or should be bought rather in order to get the required amount for the recipe. Very good. Now, part three. One carton of milk is poured into a cylindrical cup of internal diameter, five centimeters. What is the height of milk in the cup? Give your answer to three significant figures. Now, if you take one of the cartons of milk, I think my camera is still on. My camera is still on, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. So let's say, for instance, you take this carton of milk and, um, well, this kind of thing, but anyways, I'm just using it for demonstration purposes. And you pour it out into this, into this cup, right? The cup, of course, has the right shape, which is cylindrical. And, of course, let's say the internal diameter is five centimeters then what we know is that the volume of milk from the carton is going to be equal to the volume of milk in the cup, okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And of course, because the cup is cylindrical, what is the formula for the volume of a cylinder again? Remind me. Um, Length times width times height. All right. Stop, stop. Listen again. The volume, formula for the volume of a cylinder, cylinder. Um, so it is cross-sectional area times height, but 
What is the formula for the cross-sectional area? So if we're talking about a cylinder of radius R. So the radius of the, cross of the circular cross-section is R and the height is H. Remember that the area of the cross-section, A, is equal to pi R squared. That's the area of the circular cross-section. And the volume is equal to the area of the cross-section times the height. And so V is equal to pi R squared H. Good? Yes, sir. So always remember your formula. If you use them often enough, you will start to remember them. So that is a formula for the volume of the cylinder. So basically, however, because you know the volume of milk in the carton, what we're going to have is this. In this particular case, the internal diameter is 2.5. So the diameter D is equal, to, is sorry, 5 centimeters. The radius is equal to a half the diameter or the diameter divided by 2. That gives us 5 over 2, same thing as 2.5 centimeters. So in this case, now we can go ahead and say that the volume of milk, or we can say, well, pi r squared h is equal to the volume of milk. And we can now substitute the values that we do know and then solve for the ones that we do not know, which of course in this case is h. So we're told to use pi as 3.14 and to express the height character three significant figures. So let's do that. So what we have is this, 3.14 times 2.5 squared times h is equal to 240 centimeters cubed, right? And we basically work this out and we solve for h. Let me say 2.25 is about 6.25. So what is 3.14 times 6.25? Sorry, 19.656. All right, so let me use all the decimal places. So 19.656H is equal to 240. So I'm going to divide both sides by 19. 0.656. Let me clear the rest of the screen here. Right, so when I divide both sides by 19.656, the 19.656 on the left hand side are going to cancel each other, and then I'll be able to find my height h. So these will cancel, and so h is equal to 240 centimeters cubed divided by 19.656 centimeters squared. So give me that value to three significant figures. Wait, so I think uh, I gave you the wrong calculation. I think it's 19. I gave you the wrong thing? All right, so check, fix, it, fix it for me and tell me the correct thing. Sorry, I got 19.625 now. All right, so 19.625, 19.625, 19 19.625. Well, just as before, the ones on the left-hand side will cancel, so these cancel. So we're dividing now by 19.625. So this is divided by 19.625 centimeters squared. All right, so what I told for me? All right, so um, Renako, do this for me. I have a calculator. Well, you should, yeah. So divide 240 by 19.625 and tell me what you get. So you're hearing me, sir? Hmm? So you're hearing me? I'm hearing you now, yes. 12. Two, two, nine. All right, so let's let's work okay. with this from here. Yeah, right, let's work with it from here. This will be centimeters. Now the question asks for it to be expressed to three significant figures. Now, um, what are significant figures? In this case, 
we know that all non-zero digits are significant. So any digit between 1 to 9 is significant. So it's 12.229. That currently has five significant figures. So if we want to express the three significant figures, essentially that means one decimal place. So we want to express this to one decimal place. The digit in the first decimal place is 2. The one after is 2, which is less than 5. And so when we round this number, we still get 12.2 centimeters, right? So we're not too clear on significant figures. I think I would have covered um, at least a couple of sessions in which I looked at that and I would have recorded them. And I probably would have, I think I would have shared the recording. You know, so you can go and check the, the recording to see if you find anything involving that topic when you're looking at general calculations, right? Mm -hmm. So the height would be 12.2 centimeters, correct to two significant figures, okay? Three okay. significant figures, rather. Three significant figures. All right, okay. let's go. Let's continue. So we have another question. I realize that these questions are all have to deal with um, the, the cuboid, which is good. So we can actually focus on some of the different um, well, particular area of this topic. Uh, we have done quite a few questions and circles on the sector. All right, so go ahead and start this one. Let me see how many marks. Ten marks. Mm, we'll try to do this one in ten minutes or, you know, let's try for that. Ten minutes. So, of course, read the question carefully and figure out what is being asked and then go ahead and try to do that.
finish it. Mm. So finish school, sir. Mm, finish as well? Yes, sir. All right, good. Let's look at this one. So this is from January 2009. It says, a company makes cereal boxes in the shape of a right prison. So, I mean, it's essentially a, a cuboid, but essentially standing straight up, right? So, yeah, what, what is it? Uh, yeah, basically. So something similar to this. So each large box has dimensions 25 centimeters by 8 centimeters by 36 centimeters. Right, so it means that the area of the base would be 20, or the dimensions of the base would be 25 by 8. We have the base there, and of course, we have the height, right? So it says, calculate the volume in cubic centimeters of one large cereal box. So again, we know the formula volume is equal to length by the width by the height, um, which is, of course, is equal to 36 centimeters by, I mean, in this particular case, I mean, it's just the area of the base times the height. So, in this case, I mean, well, because it's standing like this, we're not going to be too fussy about which is the width, which is the height, or which is the base, you know, things like that. So don't worry about that, right? So just put these values here, 36 by 25 centimeters by 8 centimeters. 8 times 25, that's 200. 200 times 36, that is 7,200 centimeters cubed. Did you get that? Yes, sir. Right. Now, part B. So, part B says, calculate the total surface area of one large cereal box. Now, this is very important. Now, let's imagine this is the cereal box, right? So, in terms of the total surface area, we're talking about the area of all the six spaces add up together. You understand? So, if you look at this, uh, this one I'm holding. So, yeah, focus on my, my camera now for a while. Right? So if we look at this, I'm holding. Then we know that the, 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 the face that is towards you will have an opposite face of equal dimensions. And in this particular case, um, let me try to number these faces on the diagram. So let this one be number one, this little one to the side be number two, and the base, of course, be number three. So each of those faces will have another one of the same exact dimensions. And so when you're finding the total surface area, you must basically find the area of the three faces that you can see, add them up and multiply by two. So in terms of the total surface area, is going to be, so we call that the total surface area, TSA, equals. So two times, so for phase one, phase one has height 36 centimeters and it has width 25 centimeters. Are you, are you with me? You seeing that? Yes, sir. So if you look at my image now, the height is basically 36 centimeters, and we have the base, which is 25. So this is 36 times 25. So 36 times 25. So that's phase one. Phase two also has a height of 36 centimeters, but its width is 8. So this is plus 36 times 8, right? In terms of my little thing I'm holding up, I'm going to rotate it, and it will be this side I'm now facing you. So the same height, but the width, of course, is different. And then now, phase three will be the top or the bottom of the, of the, of the prism. And it has dimensions 25 by 8. So we're going to have plus 25 by 8. We work out all of that, and we multiply the result by 2. So this is going to be 2 times, let me see, what is 36 times 25? That's a 900. That looks like 900. Yes, sir. Right? Plus, now 36 times 8. That's um, 144 times 2, which of course is what? 288? Yes, sir. And then 25 times 8, that, that is 200, right? 200. So basically, we have 2 times 900 plus 200, 1100. Plus 288, 1388. So 2 times 1388, what does that give us? 2776. Check my math yes, for me. So 2776 centimeters squared. So you have to understand the concept of total surface area. 
the total surface area is basically the total area that you would actually get if you cut open this shape and you lay it out flat, right? It will take up that particular area. That is what we mean by the total surface area. So if I was to cut open this box, lay it out flat, it will take up that particular area, 2,770. Well, not this box, but the one in the question, right? But if I was to open it up, I would, I would be able to show you exactly what we mean by the total surface area. Um, let me see. All right, I can open it up somewhat. Um, yeah, let me try to enter anything right. I hope I, I will know how to put it back together. <laughs> All right. So yeah, so I'm trying to open it up here so you can get an idea. All right. So if we open it up, um, something like this. Right. So. That's basically what well, some of these little parts are full, but you get the idea, right? Yeah. So you open it up and the, and the area of this entire thing will be the total surface area, all right? Yeah. All right, so let me scroll up to the next question here. Oh, we're not finished. We're not finished. That's the total surface area. Now it says calculate the volume. Oh no, the cereal from one large box can exactly fill six small boxes, each of equal volume. So if the cereal from one large box can fit exactly fit fill six small boxes, each of equal volume then of course the volume of one small box is going to be equal to the volume of a large box divided by what number? Six. 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 Yes. So therefore to find the volume of one small box, we divide the volume of one large box by six. So therefore the volume of one small box would be equal to um, 7,200 centimeter cube divided by six. And that gives us 1,200 centimeter cube, all right? Mm -hmm. Then now part two says, if the height of a small box is 20 centimeters, list two different pairs of values which the company can use for the length and the width of the small box. So we now know the volume of a small box and they give us the height. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the area of the base, right? And after we find the area of the base, we simply find two numbers that multiply to give that area. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Right? So we're going to say that the area of the base times the height, of course, is equal to the volume. Right? So this area of the base is A, and the height is actually 20 centimeters. And that is going to give us 1,200 centimeters cubed. So if we divide both sides by 20, we'll get the area. And so A would be equal to, what's that? Six, 600 centimeters squared, right? So we have um, a, 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 a small box and the area of the base is 600 centimeters squared. So I want each of you to tell me two possible combinations for the length and the width. In other words, give me a pair of numbers that multiply to give 600. And don't tell me 600 by one. That's not realistic. So come, tell me two realistic numbers that can be used for the area of this base of the box that multiply to give 600. Quickly. Oh, sir, I had 50 and 12 and... 100. All right, all right. So 50 and 12 could work. So I could say 50 and 12, yes. Mm -hmm. What about you, Renako? Two numbers that multiply to give 600. One hundred and six. That could work too. 106 might not be the most, you know, stable box, but 106 could work. So because I just said two, then you know they didn't specify that a must be realistic, but I'm just saying that's realistic. So we can we have multiple pairs of values. For instance, we could have 20 and 30. We could have um 60 and 10. 
we could have say 45, 45 can go to 6, so let me say 45, um, 45, no, 45 won't work, not 45. Um, we could do well. Yeah, let's say 50 and 12. We could have 24 and 25. We have so many could use, right? So 24 and 25 could work as well, right? Yes. So yes, that is it there. All right. So we did this little one, of course, already with a little sector, right? We did this one too, right? So it seems as if we have we have done most of these so far. Mm -hmm. So we have we have kind of exhausted those involving the the, the rectangle and the cuboids. Um, mm Yeah, let me see if I know. All right, so we have done most of these up here already. Which page is this? This is what page? Six. Oh, did this one already? So I think this is the one. That one too. Yeah, we did, we did quite a few of these. Yeah, we did 20 of these already. Yeah, yeah we did this one. So that's the last page. Yeah, page one. Now let's see if we find one to give you to try. I think we did this, this question with the pizza already, not so? We did this one with the pizza? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I don't remember doing this one. Um. The diagram below, not drawn to scale, shows a block of wood in the shape of a semicircular prism. The cross section of the prism is a semicircle with diameter 30 centimeters. The length of the prism is 1.2 meters. We did this similar question number one, but I don't think we did this one. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we did. Yeah. So the one to calculate, giving your answer to three significant figures, the area in centimeters squared of the cross section, and the volume in centimeter cube of the prism. Now, the area of the cross section is a semicircle. But tell me, what is the formula for the area of a circle? Area of a circle of radius r. What is the formula for the area of a circle of radius r? You can't tell me that. So, 2 pi r squared. Take off the 2. So, pi r squared, sir. Pi r squared, yes. So the area of a circle of radius r is pi r squared. So if we're talking about a semicircle, which by definition is a half a circle, then the area of the semicircle is equal to pi r squared divided by 2. Okay? So you're given the diameter. And of course, you have to remember that the diameter is twice the radius which means the radius is equal to half the diameter, okay? So I want you to take this information that you have there, go ahead, find the area of the cross section, and of course the volume. Now, when you're working out the volume, the length is given in meters, you're gonna have to convert that to centimeters, is that clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So work out the area of the cross section using this formula, and then of course you're gonna say the volume is equal to the area of the cross section times the length L. Go ahead and do that for me. And pay attention to the number of significant figures, that is important.
Going through? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so finish. Yeah, man, yeah, man. Finish, sir. Finish. All right, good. Finish, sir. All right, so this one, we know the formulas that we're supposed to be using, right? So... Go to semicircle. All right, so first of all, we know that the radius r is equal to diameter divided by two. So this is 30 divided by two, which is equal to 15 centimeters. And the area of the cross section, so the area of the semicircular cross section is equal to pi r squared divided by two, and we're told to use pi as 3.14. You have to pay attention to those instructions. Sometimes they tell you to use pi as 22 over 7. Other times they give you as 3.14. So this is 3.14 times 15 squared divided by 2. Now, I want, I'm going to write this down to a, a large number of significant figures. But I want you to tell me what is the answer to correct the three significant figures. So 15 squared times 3.14 divided by uh, times 0.5 or divided by 2. What does that give you? Fraction to me. So this is actually equal to 353.25 um, centimeters squared. So come on, in. how many significant figures are in this number? Five, sir. Five. So what does this number correct the three significant figures? 353 centimeters. That is correct. 353 centimeters squared, okay? And if you need to review significant figures, you can do that. Now for the volume, then the volume is equal to the area of cross section times the length. The length is given in meters, so we'll convert that one time. This 1.2 meters is equal to 1.2 times 100. Why 100? Because 100 centimeters equal 1 meter, and therefore to convert from meters to centimeters, we multiply by 100. So this gives us 120 centimeters. And so volume equals area times length, so therefore means that V is equal to area 353 centimeters squared times 100 centimeters. And because we're multiplying by 100, we just add two zeros. So we get V equals 35,300 centimeter cube. Now at C set max, le max level, you're taught that these two zeros are not significant. So this number would actually have three significant figures. But if you're not sure, expressing the number in standard form will remove all form of doubt. So this, of course, is the same thing as 3.53 times 10 to the 4 centimeter cube. So there's no question as to how many significant figures this has, but the two numbers are actually equivalent in terms of their magnitude, but just expressed differently. Okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to look at some more questions involving circles and cones. I had seen one down here involving a cone, but I kind of scrolled past it inadvertently. So let me see it here. All right. So I would have done the would have done this piece below that I circled or in, um, highlighted in the, the, the pink um, pink box. 
um, but we want to do the piece above it, right? Mm -hmm. So this one says, the diagram represents a right circular cone with a base radius of nine centimeters. So let's put some information on the question. So the, we have a, we can see the little triangle inscribed in the in the cone. So this, of course, a bit of radius right here, nine centimeters, right? Um, it says, and a slant height of fifteen centimeters. This right here would be fifteen centimeter, right? The diagram, yeah. The cone is cut along OC and unrolled to form a sector OC C prime from a circle of center O. Take pi to the 3.14. Calculate the length in centimeter of the arc C C prime. And of course, um, mm, the size and radiance of the angle C O C prime subtended by the arc C C prime. And three, the area in centimeters squared of the curved surface of the cone. Now, let me try to represent what is happening here. Now, whenever you take a cone like this, it's my cursor, and you cut it open, as you said, you're going to form a sector. You have to be able to identify the relationship between certain measurements of the cone and those of the sector, right? So let's say here we have our cone. Right, we have a cone that is a circular cross section, right? And this cone is of radius r, right? Cone is of radius r. And we're given the, 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 the perpendicular height. Now, this would be the perpendicular height. Let's call it h, which means that this is actually going to form a right angle triangle. This is h, and let's call this length big R. Good? You with me so far? Yes, sir. Now, what is the formula for the circumference of the circular cross section of this cone? So, the circumference of the circular cross section. Who remembers the formula for circumference? So it's 2 pi r. That is correct. So, the formula for the um, circumference of the circular cross section is equal to 2 pi r. But we're talking about small r, the radius of the actual circle. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So when you cut open this cone along the slant side r, what you're going to form is a sector. Let me clear my diagram a little bit. Oh, I will have a sector. So let me just use this. Let me just use this one here. Yeah, last time I used a certain method to find the height, but I use a slightly different method this time. So I'm, I'm, I'm using this same image from before. Yeah. I just want to erase this red piece. In Anyways, I'll just draw it back. Right. So when you cut open this sector, or yeah, this cone rather, what you're going to form is a sector right this sector this will still be your this will be your r the same r from before this is your r big r right and of course angle want us to find this angle is theta right but this piece the the length of the arc that is formed is actually equal to the circumference of the original circular cross section of the of the cone so this piece c this is equal to the circumference of the of the cone the cross section of the cone you follow me yes sir so when you cut open the con the cone you're going to form a sector the circumference or the length of the arc formed will be equal to the circumference of the circular portion of the cone right so in this particular case we're given that the radius of the cone, r, is equal to 9 centimeters. So small r is equal to 9 centimeters, and big r is equal to 15 centimeters. So this is big r gone, right? So therefore, this circumference right here is going to be equal to c equals 2 times 3.14 times 9. Work it out for me, please. 2.14. 
2 times 3.1, 4 times 9. So I got 56.52. All right, so 56.52 centimeters, right? So when you cut it open, what that means is that the length of this arc right here would be 56. 0.52 centimeters. That is always the case when we cut a um, cone open along its slant edge, right? Good. So that is the significance there. And now what happens is this. When you cut open the cone, essentially this slant length becomes the radius of the sector. You understand? So, so the length of the slant edge becomes the radius of the sector. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Right. Now, the next part of the question, or what they ask us for in the question, is to find the length in centimeters of the arc CC prime. So, using the dimensions that we want to say, let's say the arc is CC prime. Let me just put the, 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 the letters there. So, this, of course, we know that is the 56. Well, we already found that basically, but let me just put the values here. So, this, of course, would be 56.52. And so, this would be C, let's call it C prime. And this, of course, will be center O. Right? So, therefore, the length of the arc CC prime would be equal to the circumference of the circular cross section of the cone. Is that clear? Yes, sir. All right, good. The, when you cut open the, 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 um, the cone, you form a sector. The length of the arc formed will be equal to the circumference of the circular cross section of the cone that was given in the first place. So in this case, we had a cone of radius r, where r is equal to 9 centimeters. We find the circumference of that circular cross section, we get 56.52 centimeters. When you cut open that sector, the length of the arc formed will be equal to this, the circumference of the circle. All right? Okay, sir. Mm -hmm. Now, the next part, what we want to find out is the angle. Where is it here? The length, so we have that. The size in radians of the angle COC prime subtended by the arc CC prime. So I'm talking about this angle that I label theta. Now, how do we go about finding that angle? That is where the formula for the length of the arc comes in. Does anybody remember the formula for the length of an arc? Yes or no? Quickly, quickly. No, sir. Right, yes or no? That's all right. So the length of an arc is given by the formula. Sometimes we call it S for the length of the arc. So let me stop around. Put me on my voice now. So the length of the arc, we can say S is equal to R times theta, where theta, of course, is in radians. Theta must be in radians. So here we have the arc, CC prime. The angle theta is in radians. And in this case, the radius that we're looking for is this big R, right? So this right here would be the radius of the sector formed. So this is now the radius of the sector formed. So basically, when you put this values, these values into the formula, we can see that the radius, which is 15, because we had it from before, R is equal to 15, right? So this is equal to 15 centimeters. So we can see that 15 theta is equal to 56.52 centimeters. And so therefore we divide both sides by 15, and that is how we get the angle in radians. Tell me if that is making sense. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So <laughs> let, me, let me explain it one more time. We found the circumference of the circular cross section of the cone that we're given. That gave us 56.52 centimeters. When we cut open that cone along the slant edge, then what we get is a sector. We form a sector. The length of the arc formed will be equal to the circumference that we calculated. That is the circumference of the circular cross section of the cone. Good. Now, the slant edge will now form the radius of the sector. And so that was 15. So the 
radius of this um set the sector is now 15. And so using the formula for the length of an arc, S equals R theta. In this formula, theta of course must be in radians. So that's a little c to indicate it is radiant as opposed to degrees. So I have the length of the arc, I have the radius, and therefore I simply solve for the angle theta. So go to your calculator and divide 56.52 by 15 and give me to about two decimal places. So 3.77. So what this means is that the angle theta in radians is equal to 3.77. So that would be the size of that angle there in radians, 3.77. Right? So the, 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 the question below, I would have done it last week, but I did tell it a bit more complicated. I actually used tricks to find the angle and all that, but um, all that was necessary, but other method that came to me at that time. But this particular time, once you have the length of the arc, and of course you have the radius of the sector, which is obtained from the long edge or the slant edge of the cone, then of course we can find the length of the arc or the angle rather using the formula S equals R theta, where S is the length of the arc. Okay? Yes, sir. So in my estimation, these ones with the circles and the sectors tend to give a little bit more trouble because of the tricks involved. The, the ones involving the, 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 um, the cubes or the cuboids and the rectangular prisms, those are a bit more straightforward, but students tend to struggle with these ones more because they have a little bit more um, stuff to deal in terms of the trigonometry, you know? It's not so clear cut as some of the others. So I think we've gone through most of these questions. So I will urge you to access the other past papers in the Google Classroom. Um, you could start with the most recent paper and then work your way back and then work all the past papers involving this type of thing, area and volume. You have to get a lot of practice on your own, okay? Okay, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So yeah, I will, um, I'm trying to remember if I got January 2024 people. I think somebody sent it to me and I don't remember. Um, but if I have it, I will I will share it with you all, right? Yes, sir. All right, man. All right, so we'll end the session there. And of course, we'll pick up again next week. Again, you have less than three months before the exam. So I implore you to practice questions, not just for maths, but all the other subjects that you're doing, you need a lot of practice. I know for a fact that you have a wealth of past papers available to you in this Google Classroom. So you, have, you, don't, you don't have any um, excuses if you don't have past papers. By the way, um, Renato, I added you to the Google Classroom, right? Yes, sir. All right. So there's a section there for past papers. I have a whole set of past papers. Um, I'm going to be searching my phone because I think somebody had sent me January 2024. If I find it, I will actually share it with you. All right. Yes, sir. All right, man. Take care and be, be productive. Yes, sir. Bye, sir. Yeah, man. Later. Later, sir.